Dr. Kevin Stork is, is predicting high behaviour using forecast weather, the importance of scale and timing. And just a, a bit of background about Kevin for those people who, who don't know him. Kevin is an honorary associate professor in climatology and management uh, here at the uh, School of Ecosystem and Forest Sciences at the University of Melbourne. That's something that makes him impressive. Um, Kevin in 2015 was made a member of the Order of Australia and in 2016 uh, given an Ember Award by the International Association of Wildland Fire uh, for, for his work. A very prestigious um, uh, awards in both cases, of course. Kevin's research, the most recent research activity, has been applying bush virus management and decision support systems for example, and established a, a bushfire science research team in the School of Ecosystem and Forest Sciences, looking at a range of research, fire, land, and, uh, and teaching, and that, and that group is, is continuing and working today. So, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so I guess <coughs> what I really want to look at today, this is uh, something that Andrew up the back there will be quite familiar with this slide, comes up quite often. But it's a really interesting portrayal of how important scale is to fire behaviour. So here we have three fires all lit at the same time, under the same weather conditions and similar fuel and similar terrain. Uh, but you can see that the, the fire that's been lit by the um, 100 metre long line here has progressed quicker than the 50 metre line, it's progressed significantly quicker than the point ignition. So the scale of fire and how it's able to integrate the weather, the fuel, the terrain is important, even at these relatively small scales. I think another aspect of this that uh, needs to be uh, considered more, and meteorologists do this all the time, but the heat that's coming off the fire ground is not just coming from the flame fronts. We get very attracted to the flames because it's uh, naturally attractive to us, I guess, is a uh, as humans, but in fact that what's important here is it's basically collecting all the heat off the fire into one parcel effectively. So the plume is helping drive the fire, uh, but it's also helping draw the sides of the fire in and it's helping slow the fire down. So if you have heavier fuels, it will probably go slower to some extent because the, the uh, convective updraft is diverting the uh, incoming winds. So in each of these fires, we can sort of see the area of active heat that's contributing to the plume, which is affecting the, the control of the fire. And it's one of the reasons why we get this sort of parabolic sort of shape of a fire, even though the fire started off as a straight line. So we see in a, a little spot fire here, uh, this is described burn. But if you look at the flames around this little ignition gets started off with a point ignition somewhere in the middle here, but all of those flames have been drawn to a heat centre, into the centre of that uh, fire at this point. So the convection column in the centre here is having control over all that flame front. As the fire grows, it loses its capacity to control all the fire and it will only basically affect the, the leading edge um, predominantly of the, of the fire here. And the back of the fire will have very little, um, be affected very little by the deployment as it, it moves. So we need to understand, I suppose, that it's a three-dimensional phenomenon. We so often look at fires as a two-dimensional phenomenon. When you look at it mapped, it's shown as a two-dimensional factor. But in fact, it's very much a three-dimensional process and we need to take that into account when we're looking at how important weather uh, feedbacks are going to uh, uh, affect the fire behaviour. The other thing that Beth has already alluded to to some extent is the importance of scale and particularly going up to the blow-up conditions. But at initiation, when matches dropped if you like. Um, what's important is the arrangement of each leaf and twig or the grass tussock or whatever. The surface moisture is quite important and whether it happens to be in the same shade or in the sun, that makes a difference. Once we get a surface fire, it's more about fuel bed and the continuity of that fuel bed. The profile of moisture content of the litter bed is important. And that two metre wind, wind, the local weather conditions are what's important. As we get into a crown fire, we start to see that it's more about crown density and uh, the other components in the, the fuel strata, things like the, the drought index, what the seasonal dryness is like, um, and 10 metre weather at a more regional sort of level. 
when we get to bog conditions, it's more about just broad vegetation distribution. Uh, <coughs> things like dew point and other humidity become much more important, and really the stability of the atmosphere becomes a, a major player in fire behaviour. So, in fires, we need to know all of these scales of things because we have spot fires starting all the time, in, particularly in new fires, but the fire may progress all the way up to bog conditions. Not always. Sometimes it never gets beyond the surface fire. Sometimes it'll get to canopy fire, sometimes we get up to the bog conditions. A lot of our thinking, our planning, the Australian standard, for example, basically, and a lot of our training for firefighters happens around this area that I've been up here with that uh, over. So that gets used for a lot of the design criteria. <laughs> Again, as Beth said, more than 90% of the damage that's done by fires uh, is done basically up to that blow up condition stage. So Black Saturday is a, a great example of that. So <clears throat> we need to be able to shift scales. And this is not just the progression from one to the other. Some of these scales are happening locally all the time throughout the life of the fire, but fires also have a development and build up phase and they also have a die down phase. So it's not just about the um, gradual a gradual progression, there's different phases over time and different factors are important at different parts of the fire. So if we look at, this is a Black Saturday fire uh, at Churchill, if we look at the fire running up the, the side of the there, what we notice is there's a significant area of that fire that's contributing heat to the smoke column. It's not just the flame in front. And if we go back a bit, so this is a, a photograph taken from the same location but zoomed out, we can basically see <coughs> this convection column is having a big influence on the behaviour of the fire. But again, we tend to focus so much on what's happening at the surface level. But in fact, this is having a big control. And you see at the very top there, this is starting uh, uh, potential for uh, pyrocumulus uh, uh, convection to start occurring here. And there was some interesting work back in the 1970s, and, and uh, Dave Packham will be able to tell you all about it because he was involved, but over in Western Australia where they looked at some of this um, effect of the condensation in this uh, bioaccumulant sort of formation that connected through the convection column was almost, in, in the right circumstances, was almost doubling the effect of the amount of fuel that was being burnt in terms of the fire behaviour. But the extra heat being released through the the latent heat of vaporisation up there is um, effectively helping draw the column up, which helps draw the wind in the base of the fire, speeds up the progression of the fire and the spotting process. So we ignore what's happening above the surface at our peril. If we look at a uh, satellite image from Black Saturday fires, um, so this was taken at about 4 o'clock on Black Saturday. The red areas you can see is sort of the, the hottest part of the, uh, the, the fire. But what you will note is that the convection columns aren't directly aligned with the, um, the fires themselves. So they're off at a bit of an angle. And what we found actually on Black Saturday, the fires were travelling at about 9 degrees different to what the surface winds were. So the convection columns were actually pulling them to the, to the left, if you like, because the upper winds were different to the surface winds, they were more westerly. So that affects where the spotting goes, but also helps direct where the fire is going. So it's not just the surface wind phenomena, we have these upper winds having an influence, uh, to a lesser extent, but still a significant influence on the spread and direction of the fire. So on Black Saturday, we <coughs> already had uh, the gridded weather forecast information being provided to us. We had fire behaviour analysts in um, the State Control Centre and this was a prediction done for the Kilmore fire on Black Saturday and this one was done for the Murrindini fire, Black Saturday. What you can see in particular with this Kilmore fire, which was the first one that was being done, is the orientation is wrong. And the reason for that is the original forecast was for the wind change to come through at about 9 o'clock in the evening whereas in fact it's coming through the, the change was coming through more quickly and actually hit the area closer to 6 o'clock in the evening. So because <coughs> the work had been done on pr projecting the uh, extent of this fire and it was time critical, uh, 
didn't change the uh, orientation because that was going to be a slow process, but we captured both the wind change and the, the change in uh, direction that we knew was happening with this outer line. And what you can see in both of these predictions is based on the forecast <coughs> weather that we had and some local observations with a bit of adjustment in, in this case, um, we actually got a pretty good representation of the likely extent of the fire. So even though there were quite extreme fire behaviour conditions, using our existing models and our understanding of fire, we were able to give quite a reasonable uh, extent of that fire, apart from the orientation in this case. Um, and some of these <coughs> little areas that are outside our prediction actually occurred days later, so they weren't within the, the predicted period anyway. So the weather forecast was quite a useful guide to us, but we had to adjust it to some extent based on the observations of what was actually happening. So in retrospect, we can be really clever and just use the observed weather, and we can get a really good uh, match between the, the brown-red colour here, which is a phoenix prediction of the, the five for a simulation, and the white lines here are a reconstruction of what actually happened. So you can see you get a really good match if you know exactly, you know, this is in hindsight rather than at the time. In South Australia recently, so this is 2015, this was a prediction made of the Pinery Fire uh, by a fire behaviour analyst over there using the forecast of weather. And a similar situation, that the change was coming through more quickly than it was uh, initially forecast. Knowing that, knowing that the fire was actually travelling in a different direction from what was being predicted uh, using the forecast of weather, the fire behaviour analyst went to the meteorologist that was on duty at the time, had a discussion, and then came up with a revised map of the likely extent of the fire. And using a slightly different colour scheme, so the yellow here is the, the prediction, the pink line is the final extent of the fire. Just by readjusting the forecast weather based on the timing of the change and so on, there was an amazingly good uh, prediction being made. This is uh, about an hour, uh, hour and a half, I think it was, after the fire actually started. So it's quite early in the, uh, the life of the fire. But the final extent of the fire was pretty well predicted on the day from that forecast weather. But this is in a relatively simple system in the sense that it's not a lot of topography and the, the fuels were largely grassland. So <coughs> we did some work with the Bureau and Geoscience Australia looking at models, weather, uh, numerical weather prediction models of different spatial scales, 400 metres, 1200 metres and 3,600 three uh, metre uh, grid cells and five, well, different time intervals as well. So, um, I'll give you the time intervals after. So we can get some quite detailed information from these models. The green line that you see through there is one minute observational data from uh, the Kilmore, Kilmore Gap at AWX. What we can see from the observed compared with the predicted at different spatial scales is the timing of the change is different. So with a 400 metre uh, prediction, the timing of the change is about an hour out. The, um, with the three and a half kilometre um, scale flight, it's about an hour and 40 minutes out compared with what was actually observed. So that finer scale resolution has actually improved the timing, which is quite important to us. So what we did was basically compare the um, observed versus the predicted fire spread using that um, was by spread the um, gridded weather forecast information. And we basically did it some metrics on it. We looked at, there were 18 time references in the progression of this fire. This is the Gilmore fire. And zero means it's perfect uh, prediction. So the area difference index which we, we developed, the lower the number, the better. And what you can see in the yellow here is the, for each of the spatial and temporal scale, so it's 400 metres at 5 minutes, 400 metres at 15 minutes, 400 metres at three, uh, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 1200 metres at 5, 15, 30, 60 minutes, and 3.5 kilometres at 5. So we've got the temporal and spatial scale. And what you can see there is that the finer scale wasn't actually as useful to us as we thought it might have been for fire behaviour prediction on that scale of fire. And when we look at this uh, nasty worm diagram here, what we can see is that there's a distinct split in um, the progression of the fire here. 
And in the early stages of the fire development, so this is in the first uh, three hours or two and a half hours, what we can see is in fact the 1200 metre or 400 metre uh, resolution data is providing us the, the lowest area difference index, so the best prediction. But there's a change here, and after that change, we actually see that the, the broader scale, the 300, uh, three and a half kilometre um, prediction, is give, weather forecast is giving us a much better relationship because the scale of the fire has significantly changed. So what we're seeing is <coughs> in that first period of time, the fire is mostly in grassland, relatively undulating country. It's a relatively uh, uniform build-up conditions. So if we go back to, to here, that's this phase here. What happens then is the fire moves into more mountainous terrain, so it's steeper, it's wet forest, there's more fuel, and we get a significantly greater convection conform from that uh, process. And the real spotting started at the top of Mount Disappointment here, uh, and the further spotting that we've ever seen has occurred from Mount Disappointment to Yarra Glen, which is about 36 kilometres on that bay. So, <coughs> there's a change in the scale of the fire and we need to be adaptable, adapt to that. So, what we can get from this is fire behaviour is temporally and spatially scale sensitive. So, we shouldn't try to find the best scale. The best scale will be dependent on the, the nature of the fire. So, fire is a great integrator of the inputs, so that's to our advantage to some extent, but we need to actually, we can actually smooth over and we can sort of aggregate information, but we have to do it in a way that is going to be um, useful to, to our prediction process. The wind affects the convection columns and hence the fire spread and rate of direction. I think that's important to appreciate as well. The upper wind profile is quite important. Uh, <coughs> weather and the fuel and terrain factors change from fire initiation, the establishment, and uh, the full potential of blow-up conditions, as well as in the die-down process. We have to reverse that process in the die-down. More detail is not necessarily better in uh, being able to predict fire behaviour. The timing of changes in the weather is critical, so we really would like to have it less than 10 minutes. If your fire is moving at 15 kilometres an hour and you're out by an hour, 15 kilometres is a lot of houses and a lot of people potentially. So fire behaviour prediction is more difficult than uh, weather prediction, I've got to say. So you guys have got it easy. Because you know? <laughs> that's just one of our inputs. And if you're really interested in reading a bit more, one of the Bushfire CRC reports that we did uh, has a lot more detail about uh, what we went through that. But what's important here is that um, we need to think about the scale. We really need to think about three-dimensional attributes of, of both fire and weather, because they interact significantly, and really change for some of us, we need to change our thinking of fire as a two-dimensional process to three-dimensional, and if we say it's three-dimensional, how do we then deal with it? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. There's time for a couple of questions, if anyone has those questions for Kevin's presentation. Yeah, the spots. The spots are important for the progression of the Kilmore response. So do you describe the spots and you have some kind of statistical way of portraying it? Yeah, the spotting process, is, as you say, is, it's really important. It's not just our flame front sort of progression. So in the Phoenix model, we deliberately uh, model the, the spotting process as an independent process. And each, um, we start new fires effectively and then there's a potential for coalescence of those fires. So, you have to have ember material to produce the spotting in the first place. So if it's not there, you don't have spotting. So it depends on the bark type to a large extent. You then have to have the transport. So that depends on the, the wind strength and direction as to where those embers might land. When they land, you, you also have to look at the, the nature of the fuels they're landing into. Is there enough fuel? And is that fuel in a dry enough state to actually ignite? So there's a probability. So we look at the probability of ignition. And once probability exceeds one, we'll light a fire in that cell. So it's quite a process, and then, so in fact we're not modelling one fire, we're modelling thousands of fires in this simultaneously, but each of those spot fires also will have a build up phase in its own right, so often they will get overrun. Yeah, great. Uh, 
Uh, Kevin, you, you had a great slide there, the satellite image with the convection column here at Mount Grays, I think, to the left, I think you said, of the, the wind or something like that. Or? Well, the fire was basically being, it was running about nine degrees to the surface wind direction. I haven't actually measured what the, uh, that was. So it might was probably a bit more than that. All right. So <laughs> then you had another slide where you did the reconstruction that showed against the observed wind, which I assume was surface level. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you build that upper atmosphere variation in direction into any calculations. If, if it is pulling the, the fire, how do, we, how do we get to that stage of being able to understand that and build that into our calculations? One of the things we tried to train five behaviour analysts in, so we're doing this work to look at the aerological diagram and see what the profiles are like. So you need to know about the strength and direction of those upper winds. So they would need to be making that as a um, Personalised sort of adjustment to the wind direction, and so that, that's going to be a bit of a judgment call. We, we did try uh, actually um, dynamically incorporating the upper winds, but the, one of the problems we had is that the grid of weather is edited, and I don't know if things have changed. But uh, so it, it's much more reliable in the upper winds. The upper winds tend not to be edited. Is that change? I don't know. And so the, there was a difference between the upper winds and the, and the, the surface winds, and so we, we found that the, we couldn't use the two. So from a 5 day the analyst point of view, the better thing is to, to look at what those upper winds are and then make some sort of uh, surface adjustment. So 9 degrees is actually quite a lot over uh, that fire around 60 kilometres. So 9 degrees over 60 kilometres so is a big area. So that has to be a human input. When you're running, when you're running, well, it, it, we're because we're looking at the effective wind at the ground level. So we, because it's time casting, and we've only got uh, weather observations from a, a single point that might be 10, 20 kilometres away from the fire. We've had to put in the wind direction that is observed by fire spread. So. Thank you. 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 Thank you.